Accountants estimate a value for your company, right? They call it book value. They estimate a book value for your equity and a book value for your overall capital. The market attaches values to exactly these numbers too. A market value of equity and an enterprise value, which is the market value for the operating assets. Now some companies traded below book value, some traded close to book value, and some traded above book value. And one question investors face is why? Why, why does it happen? In this session, I hope to look at what drives the book value multiple. And at the end of the session, you're going to find out that there are no mysteries in this process. Some companies deserve to trade at high multiples of book value, and others don't. So in the last two sessions, we've talked about earnings multiples, price earnings ratios in the first session, and EV to EBITDA multiples in the second one. This session, I want to focus in on something different. Markets estimate their values for companies, right? Market value of equity, enterprise value, they're all measures of what the market's value for this business is. But accountants estimate values for your businesses as well. In fact, we spend a lot of money getting accountants to get that number right. This session, I want to look at the relationship between the market value of a company and its book value. In fact, there are two multiples that flow directly from that transaction. The first is the price to book ratio where you take the market value of equity and you divide by the book value of equity. The second is a more expensive measure, where you take the value of the firm, market value of equity plus market value of debt, and divide by the book value of equity plus the book value of debt, or you take enterprise value, where you net cash out of the numerator, and divide by invested capital, where you net cash out of the denominator. Take a look at those three equations. Notice something? We're being internally consistent. If the numerator is just market value of equity, the denominator is just book value of equity. If the numerator is market value of equity plus market value of debt, the denominator is book value of equity plus book value of debt. If the numerator nets out cash, the denominator nets out cash. The consistency principle has to be met. So let's say we've met the consistency principle. Let's look at the distribution. As with the other multiples, I want to show you the global distribution. Again, to illustrate how much in common markets have. And across the board, you see the peak to the left, the, the tail to the right. But there are differences across markets, right? The U.S., again, has the highest price-to-book ratios of, of companies in the world. Japan has the lowest. In fact, Japan's median price-to-book ratio is less than 1, 0.67. The typical Japanese company trades at two-thirds times book value. Does that mean that Japanese companies are cheap relative to U.S. companies? It might. But before we go there, we've got to answer a simple question. What is it that drives differences across price-to-book ratios, not only across markets, but within markets across companies? To answer that question, I went back to an old ploy. Remember with price-earnings ratios, I used a stable growth dividend discount model to back out the variables that drive the price-earnings ratio? The price-to-book ratio is also an equity multiple. So again, I went to a dividend discount model the stable growth dividend discount model, I divided both sides of the equation by the book value of equity. By now you get the technique, right? I get an equation for the price to book ratio. And the price to book ratio for a stable growth company is a function of four variables. The cost of equity, measuring the risk of the company, the expected growth rate and earnings, the return in equity for the company, and the payout ratio. Three of those variables showed up when we looked at PE ratios. The return in equity, is the one variable that pops up when we introduce price to book ratios. In fact, I want to tell you that every multiple comes with what I call a driver variable, the one number you need to know to use that multiple. With price to book ratios, that driver variable is return on equity. What do I mean by that? If you have a high price to book ratio, odds are you have a high return on equity. If you have a low price to book ratio, generally speaking, it's because you have a low return on equity. Now, if you take a look at that equation of the four variables there, remember that growth itself, and we talked about this in an earlier session, can be written as a function of the retention ratio, which is one minus the payout ratio and your return on equity. If I plug that into the, into, the, into the equation, I end up with an even simpler version of a price to book ratio, and it's a very intuitive version. The price to book ratio for a stable company, if you look at the numerators, is a function of two things. It's excess returns, return on equity minus cost of equity, and it's growth rate. Companies that trade at roughly their cost of equity should trade at roughly book value. Companies that trade at well above book value usually have returns on equity that exceed the cost of equity, and companies that trade below book value is usually because the return on equity is less than the cost of equity. It focuses attention on the relationship between excess returns and price-to-book ratios.
Growth rates matter because they exaggerate that effect. So in other words, if you earn more than your cost of equity, having a high growth rate will make your price to book ratio even higher. Now the advantage of breaking down the variables that drive price to book is it gives me a rubric for looking for mismatches again. The mismatch I'm looking for is again a simple one. I want a company with a low price to book ratio, but I also want a company with a high return in equity at the minimum, and if possible, I want it with high growth and low risk. That's what I'm looking for when I look for cheap companies. So let me try a couple of examples. In the first one, I looked at a sector, and the sector I picked is the financial services sector. Financial services are particularly well-tuned to the use of price-to-book ratios, and here's why. The book value of equity at a financial service firm actually means something. Unlike a manufacturing firm where the book value of equity can become negative, the book value of equity at a bank often is the basis for regulatory capital ratios. So it actually does mean something. And banks also uniquely among companies have a mark-to-market -market rule in accounting, which means the book value of equity should be updated. So the price to book ratio is often used to find cheap banks. So these are European banks. I estimated their price to book ratios and I also estimated the returns in equity. Take a look at that list. Most of the banks that traded really low price to book ratios have really low returns in equity. Most of the banks that traded really high price to book ratios have high returns in equity. So you're looking for mismatches, right? Here are a couple of ways you can find those mismatches. One is a very simple statistical way. Find the median values for your price to book, your return in equity, and your risk measure. In this case, the risk measure I'm using is the standard deviation of the stock price. Once you find the median values, here's how you're going to look for cheap companies or undervalued companies. You want a bank that trades at below the median price to book ratio. It's cheap, has a return in equity above the median return in equity. It delivers good returns in equity and as a standard deviation below the median standard deviation for the sector. If you get a chance, go back and look at the previous table, see if you can find any. For your overvalued stocks, you're looking for stocks with the price to book ratio above the median, a return in equity below the median, and a standard deviation above the median. It's a very simple test. It's an eyeballing test, and odds are you're not going to find too many glaring exceptions, things that pass, or companies that pass through these tests. So here's the second way you can find mismatches. It draws again on a statistical technique we used in the last session, regressions. I'm trying to explain price to book ratios. The two var variables that I'm worried about are expected growth, I'm sorry, the return in equity and the risk measure. I threw the regression in, price to book as my dependent variable, return in equity and the standard deviation in stock prices as my independent variables. Regression looks pretty good, R squared of 79%, the T statistics are statistically significant. The coefficients are in, this, are in the directions I'd expect them to be. Higher return on equity banks have higher price to book ratios. Higher risk bank, banks have lower price to book ratios. You say, how, how are you going to use this? If I take this regression equation and plug back the numbers for individual banks into that equation, I'm going to get a predicted price to book for each bank. I'm going to compare the actual price to book ratio for each bank, not to the median for the sector or to other price to book ratios, but to a predicted price to book ratio for that bank. Because that predicted value takes into account the risk and the return on equity of that bank. Banks that are trading at below the predicted price to book are cheap. Banks that are trading at above their own predicted price to book ratios are expensive. Again, a good use of statistics to control for differences across banks. The other example is an example that I return to every year. And here's what I do. I'm looking on a graph for mismatches, right? Remember scatter plots and statistics where you plot one variable against another? Here's the mismatch I'm looking for. I'm not interested in companies that have high price to book ratios and high returns in equity. They're exactly where I'd expect them to be. I'm not that concerned about companies with low price to book and low return equity. They're exactly what I'd expect them to be. It's the companies that fall off those off quadrants that are your interesting companies. The companies which have low price to book and high return in equity are your undervalued companies. The companies that have high price to book and low return in equity are your overvalued companies. Again, sounds abstract, right? But here's what I do every year. I pull up the 100 largest market cap stocks in the US. I get their price to book ratios and returns in equity based on the most recent fiscal data. Then I do a scatter plot of price to book against return in equity. So each of those points you see on this graph is a company. Then I draw a regression line through 
which I fit based on, uh, you know, Excel has a regression package. There are other regression packages you can use. And I also draw two outer lines. Those outer lines are my 90% confidence intervals, which means that any stock that falls within those lines, I cannot reject the hypothesis that those stocks are fairly priced. What I'm interested in are the stocks that fall above the line and the stocks that fall below the line. The stocks that fall above the line are my overvalued stocks. In this case, there are three, Gilead Systems, Google, and Infosys. The stocks that fall below the line are my cheap stocks, undervalued stocks, and there are three, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, and Nokia. Looking at those six stocks, though, the three stocks that fall above the line have a troubling shared characteristics. They're all high-growth companies. You're saying, so what? When I look at just price to book and return in equity, I'm not looking at the other variables that drive price to book, right? We talked about growth and we talked about risk. It looks like I'm missing growth in my equation, and that's why these companies look cheap. I'm sorry, are expensive. They might not be expensive. In fact, all I might be missing is bringing in growth into my decision process. Of the three stocks that fall below the line, the fact that two are oil companies, again, is troublesome. It's troublesome because I'm looking at last year's return in equity. If you're an oil company and oil prices were high last year, you might have had a high return in equity, but the market is not, is not foolish. It looks past last year and says, hey, oil prices might come down. So those two stocks I'd be wary about because they're both oil companies, which leaves me with one out of these six stocks that looks really interesting, and that's Nokia. Does it mean I'm going to pick up the phone and call my broker and, and buy Nokia or get online and buy Nokia? Not necessarily. There might still be things I'm missing. I actually view relative valuation as an entree into intrinsic valuation. I cannot value every company out there, so I have to pick and choose. So doing a relative valuation allows me to find where I can get the most bang for my buck, where I'm most likely to find cheap companies. In this case, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take Nokia and do a full-fledged intrinsic valuation. That allows me to marry relative valuation with intrinsic valuation. Incidentally, if you're interested, I also tried the other technique. I ran a regression of price to book against beta, measuring risk, return in equity, measuring the quality of growth, and expected growth rates. This is across the 100 largest market cap companies. Again, the regression looks pretty good. And I can use that regression then to find the 10 cheapest and the 10 most expensive stocks among these 100 stocks. In summary, therefore, when you look at book value multiples, remember that book value measures accounting book value. With all its flaws and its pluses, there has to be a relationship between the market value of equity and the book value. The market value of equity and the book value of equity are connected together by the return on equity. So keep that companion variable rule in hand. Whenever you look at a multiple, try to find that companion variable or driver variable and find out more about it.